Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. It's spring. Reason to be cheerful. It's getting warmer, and what better time to be reading books, especially with our literary friend, our great friend, Beth Ann Patrick, the book critic of the LA Times, and a woman, I think, who knows more about new books than anyone else in the universe. And Beth Ann has... We'll see about that. <laughs> well, you certainly know more than I do, Beth Ann. Uh, yeah. And Beth Ann has graciously agreed to reveal seven really interesting and important new books coming out in April for spring. Uh, Bethan, you've got three works of fiction and four nonfiction. Let's begin with the fiction. Uh, the first book, I Cheerfully Refuse by Life uh, Anger, uh, published by Grove Atlantic, also my publisher. Tell me about this book. I actually, and this probably reflects my own ignorance about the fictional world, I'd never heard of L Leaf or Life. How do it's I pronounce it? Leaf, leaf or anger. Life? And Leif, and the only reason I can tell you that for sure is because I actually did my very first author event with Leif Anger in 2001 uh, at a bookstore that no longer exists in New York State. And uh, I that was for Peace Like a River. It was a much heralded debut novel. He's written um, novels since, but I cheerfully refuse is truly, it, it's his best work and it's really worth everyone's time. This is a retelling of the Orpheus and Eurydice myth in which Orpheus goes to the underworld to rescue his beloved. And so in this book, we have Rainy and he is going uh, on a journey on Lake Superior to find out what happened to his beloved wife, Lark. And what's complicating things, it's a near future book, is that Lark is one of the last booksellers left. She's a true believer in reading and ideas. And this is in a near future United States where about eight families control everything. Uh, Several reviews have noted that it sort of sounds familiar from what we've got right now in the United States. But this oligarchy that takes over has made life very difficult for lots of people. And you would think in this near future dystopian atmosphere that this would be a terrible drag, a negative book, and it's not. Its title tells the truth. I cheerfully refuse. Anger is a very spiritually driven writer. And I don't mean Anger himself may have some deep religious and faith-based convictions, but that's not what I mean when I say he's a spiritual writer. I mean that Leif Anger really cares about the human spirit and the human connection to our natural world. And that's what he's focusing on in I Cheerfully Refuse. In this book, uh, Lake Superior is sentient. It's done very, very well. I highly recommend this to everyone out there. And then, uh, speaking of lakes, we got a book about gardens. The yes. Garden, a novel by Claire Beams. Tell me about this book. This is, um, it's described as gothic and horror, is it? It is. It, this is a malevolent garden in some ways, but it's actually not the garden itself that's malevolent. It's the humans who are around it. So this is a book that starts with two couples. So Irene and George Willard are trying to start a family. And Irene has had five terrible miscarriages. She's pregnant again. And in hopes of bringing this pregnancy to term, to a live birth, she has decided that she's going to go to this special place in the Berkshires in Massachusetts where two married doctors, doctor, that the, they're, you know, referred to um, first by their married name, but Dr. Bishop, the woman, sort of, takes over things. And Dr. Bishop wants her patients, all these pregnant women, to abide by certain rules. Three of them, including Irene, find a walled garden behind the mansion where they're staying. And they discover that this garden might have some supernatural properties, some really wonderful properties. Meanwhile, 
And this is the sleight of hand that Claire Bames, um, and that's how you pronounce her name, by the way, um, actually plays on the reader, but in a very beautiful way. This is based on the 1940s history of a very odd substance called, um, let me see if I can actually pronounce it. It's um, a synthetic estrogen called DES or diethyl stilbestrol. And it was being used because people thought that it would help prevent miscarriages, but unfortunately it actually caused problems and birth defects. And BAMES does not pound this home. This is a gothic and a horror story. And is it um, feminist gothic horror? Yes, or? very much so. Very much so. And one of the things that I really think is fascinating about it, Andrew, is that it's about how pregnancy creates this power imbalance between the pregnant person and her doctor or her obstetrician. And this is... a very strange thing, but I'll tell you, I experienced it myself. I had an obstetrician when I was pregnant with our second child who said, you know, a woman who's pregnant is not fully human. That was just in 1997. Is there okay? a sort of an, an Atwoodian quality to this, a handmaid's tale? Absolutely. There's an Atwoodian quality a bit of an Orwellian quality. Ooh. I would say it also has a very, very large sprinkling of Shirley Jackson, maybe even some Stephen King. Well, if you like gothic feminist horror, then the garden is for you. Finally, uh, Leif uh, Enger may be cheerfully refusing, but it's still a rather <laughs> dark world. The, the final piece of work, I think, is a little bit more cheerful, a collection of stories by uh, Amor Taus. Uh, yes. I read his Gentleman in Moscow. He's an excellent uh, writer. Tell me about this collection. Well, I, I think that, like, as you said, Taus is an excellent writer. I've read all of his books. And in fact, I know I've reviewed The Lincoln Highway. I may have reviewed Rules of Civility at one point as well. I really enjoy his work. It is American in a quite interesting, straightforward way. Um, his previous career, before he began writing fiction, was um, in finance. And in a way, I think that informs his approach to characters and character development. He is not really interested in people changing a great deal through a story. What he's interested in is if you've got someone who is truly um, a character, as we often say, what happens to them along the way when they don't always fit their circumstances? So these pieces, there's uh, the novella and six stories. The novella is called, uh, let me make sure I get this correct. Um, it's called Eve in Hollywood, and it features Evelyn Ross, or Eve, who was in Rules of Civility as Katie Content's um, friend. And so it's kind of a nice... Uh, yeah, it sounds quite know. romantic and chill. Yes, it is. Well, you know what it is? It's sophisticated. It's, it's, very, it's a very sophisticated book. Each story, and let me tell you, they're all set in different places. You know, Eve in Hollywood, of course, L.A. Is this Philly just for sophisticated is. readers uh, or... or do unsophisticated one, people like myself, if we read it, will we become sophisticated? I think it's for people who really enjoy a certain kind of, of heightened atmosphere and you will become sophisticated by well, reading. If you're aspiring to sophistication, then this yes. is your book, especially Absolutely. for a and they're very nice, clever. Warm, very, very a nice clever warm stories. afternoon or evening. Um, yes. Finally, I, I mentioned there were three pieces of fiction than yes. for nonfiction. But there's one book, and I want to get to this before the break. There's one book that sounds, one piece of nonfiction that sounds fictional to me, but isn't. Uh, it's a, a new book by Patrice G uh, Gagne, or Gain, Sociopath, a Memoir. Is this a true story? You know, it is a true story. And let me tell you, this is someone whose name I don't know how to pronounce. Is it Patrice or Patrish? Is it Gagne or Gagne yeah, or it's, whatever. It's a female, though. That's yeah, one thing is, we know for sure, right? And uh, Gagne, the author, let's say the author, the author is a, a PhD in psychology. She's a clinical psychologist. And she says, look, I was born a sociopath, but 
sociopathy, sociopathy um, is something that can be treated. Just because you're a sociopath who doesn't have a lot of feelings, who doesn't experience a lot of the same emotions as other people do, doesn't mean that you have to become a truly bad person. But here's the thing in this book, and a lot of people are saying that it actually reads more like fiction than like the truth. Um, it, it, you know, she is a stable person now. You can tell from reading. Does that mean she's a good person? I don't know. This is not a book about morality. Is it a bit weird though? This sounds to me like a book waiting to be written. Oh, um, I know. I know. It, it does sound like a book waiting to be written. And yet she, even though she seems to delight in being mischievous and naughty, let me say this. The things that she talks about doing are pretty tame, except for the one time when she was quite young and she stabbed a classmate or a friend, I believe, a neighborhood friend, in the head with a pencil. Many of the things she does are pretty tame, you know, um, having sex with her now husband in an abandoned house, you know? I mean, well, it, we've it, all it, done that, haven't we? we, we Beth Ann? <laughs> You know, uh, I am pleading the fifth, but I will say that uh, it's interesting that she doesn't feel a lot for other people, and she also doesn't feel a lot of remorse. And yes, yeah, did is, she ever knife anyone? Um, I don't think she ever knifed anyone. Um, I think she's had impulses in her head because mm. here's what she says about herself. She says, "Okay." I feel numb a lot of the time. I don't feel the things that other people feel. So it is this pressure, she says, that builds up in my head. And the only way for me to relieve that pressure is to do something, to steal something, to lie about something, to hide something, you know, that kind of transgression. And do so you think that this is the kind of, I mean, publishing, the publishing business is rather controversial and thin-skinned in many ways. Yeah. Do you think this is the kind of book that publishers were nervous about putting out? I mean, it's it's, it's put out by a mainstream publisher, and I'm guessing yeah. it's going to do pretty well. I think it will do pretty well because I think there are so many people, let's face it, we're all self-centered like the author. So many sociopaths, especially so if many you have sociopaths, a PhD. Right? I think most people with PhDs are sociopaths. Maybe there's a connection. <laughs> between sociopaths and PhD. So anyone with a PhD out there, you need out to- there, you're a sociopath. Um, that's what Andrew says. Um, and but, if you wanna be a sociopath, maybe you should get a PhD. You know, that's, that's a, that definitely a possibility, but I will say this reads very, very well. You feel that you're hearing this story from someone who has made progress. You don't necessarily like her, but it is, it, it is, I think, very smoothly written. And I think it's a very interesting look. Too, uh, is it too smooth, uh, Bethan, do you think? Or is it genuine? No, no, it, it, it felt genuine to me. I, I mean, and, and that doesn't mean it doesn't feel fictional, okay? So. Yeah, well, it's crossing over. We're going to cross over formally after the break to yes. nonfiction. Um, uh, but I want to remind everyone that... Uh, Wonderful guest like Beth Ann Patrick, the LA Times book critic, is brought to us by Liberties, a wonderful new quarterly journal of culture and politics. It's going to run a short feature on Liberties. It's published in DC where Beth Ann lives. I know she knows the publisher as well. And we'll be back in a second to talk nonfiction for April. Don't go away, anyone. If you do, we'll knife you. News, the noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties, it's not just a journal of ideas. It's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens. Politics, opinion, substance. Liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought. A quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight, of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller can subscribe to Liberties at libertiesjournal.com. We're speaking with the Los Angeles Times book critic, Beth Ann Patrick, the last book critic, I think, left in the world. The first part of the show, we talked about nonfiction and one book called Sociopath, a memoir which seems to cross over. Um, and I asked uh, Beth Ann before the break whether Patrice Gagne, PhD, who wrote Sociopath, ever 
knifed anyone. Apparently, she stuck pencils into people, but she never knifed them. Well, one man who was knifed famously was, of course, the great Anglo-Indian, if that's the right way of describing him, author Salman Rushdie, uh, and he has a new non-fiction book out, Knife, Meditations After an Attempted Murder. I know, Beth Ann, that uh, you haven't been able to get your hands on this book because uh, it's closely embargoed. If you'd read it, the, the publishers probably would have knifed you. So There you go. Exactly. Which I'm sure Sir Solomon himself would not have approved of. Um, I want to just point out that subtitle again, uh, Meditations After an Attempted Murder. Reality check, people. This was not just something casual. This man who attacked him truly wanted him dead. And here's the important thing I want us all to remember. I don't think the New York Times, when they talked about the book's release, got this exactly right. They said, oh, the fatwa was lifted in 1998. Well, guess what? The fatwa was um, rescinded, okay, in 1998 by um, then it was uh, Mohammed Khatami who was in power in Iran. Um, but a fatwa by Sharia law cannot be rescinded if the person who issued it is still is dead. And of course, the Ayatollah Khomeini is dead. And so there is no rescinding this. Now, for the government of Iran, they might say, look, we're not paying attention to this, but there are people out there who are not stable, not as stable as our sociopath. Patrice there are sociopaths out there. Um, with, with, but, uh, there knife are people, wielding like, fanatics. So, yeah, there are people. In all seriousness, um, Beth Ann, you haven't read the book yet. What do you think that Rushdie had any? I don't know what the right word is. Uh, remorse or questions about writing this kind of book. Um, yes. It's, he's, yeah. of course, famous both for his nonfiction and his fiction. It was Midnight's Children, one of his, I mean, I don't think it was one of his necessarily best novels, but certainly most influential novels mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. created the fatwa in the first place. Did you see? It was actually the satanic verses that created the fatwa in the oh, first place. Oh, right. Yeah, I meant, sorry, uh, yeah. Midnight's Children is a wonderful book. Satanic verses is the book that right. got him his death sentence. Um, what, um, do you think he was a bit wary of writing this book? Is it going to ask for more trouble, more people coming along and trying to knife him? I think he was very wary about writing this book. He's talked about that quite a bit, that he didn't want to write it. And it's not an easy book to write, but he has said that it's something he needs to get past in order to do anything else. It's a way for him to take charge of what happened and not be a victim. Uh, I thought he lost, uh, he was badly injured. Did he, he was the use of an eye? Was that? Mm -hmm. And he still has... Um, a loss of feeling in his fingertips and his left arm, I believe. Um, and uh, he, he's been permanently changed by this attack. And I think he does have to get through it and write about it. I understand that. Uh, we're all waiting for him to be able to write the fiction that we know he can so wonderfully, wonderfully create. I, I have to also say very quickly that um, I was able to meet and interview him once um, when Harun and the Sea of Stories came out. And I found him the kind of sophisticated, there's that word again, yeah. and civilized person that this world needs more of. I don't care what you think about Salman Rushdie and uh, his, you know, marriages or his this or his that. He is a thinking person. He is a rational person. He is someone who is devoted to literature. And so this kind of attack, um, to have his perspective on it is really important because we may, in all creative endeavors, be facing more of this with more fanaticism in the years to come. Yeah, I have to admit I'm ambivalent on... Um on Rushdie. He's a Spurs supporter, so I like him for that. But I think some of his nonfiction work is a little ideological. I, I wonder whether this book will be ideological. Uh, you know, I think this book is going to be much more personal and much more about what it means for an artist to be used 
for political statements, but we, we will see. We will have to wait until next week because I was not allowed to read it. Well, but one book see. that you've read that you, I know you really love, you've already encouraged me before we went live to to, to get this author on. I don't know if show. I would say loved, but let's talk about this one. Well, you, you, you found it very intriguing. Yes. Uh, the States of the Earth, an Ecological and Racial History of Secularization by an author called Mohammed I'm a Messiane. It's published by Verso. So mm -hmm. politically, I'm guessing it's 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 a leftist or a, certainly a, a progressive book. What's the argument in the states of the earth? Well, the argument from Messiane is that he sort of places the blame, if you will, for statehood and the way we look at nation states and therefore imperialism he places the blame on Western Christendom and its imperial attempts. He's, he talks a lot about the Crusades in the early part of this book. And so he's saying, what if the earth states are actually responsible for the state of the earth? And that is um, a huge simplification, Andrew, but it is a very interesting thing to look at and think about as we deal with climate change, you know, have we exported from the West this feeling that everyone has to be a state with defenses and with dependence on fossil fuels? And he's really interrogating the idea of secularization because he actually thinks that secular um Secular governments are a good thing, but that what we consider secular in the West is actually a promotion of capitalism. It's not real secularism. It's he, he thinks that we should have kept, you know, an idea of God or gods, you know, in our that we shouldn't have separation of church and state completely. But I'm not sure if he fully agrees with me that a sense of spirituality doesn't have to have a great deal to do with faith. He has a long section in it's in his last chapter before his epilogue. He has a section on the word religion and how that's a Western word, a word derived from Western languages and used for Western purposes. But I want to say um, Dr. Meziane, he's just really well known as a very young maverick philosopher. Okay. Uh, I want to say, what about the idea of spirituality and a sense of wonder and how those things need to be encouraged in humans in order to have the kind of governments that we need in this world that is changing so rapidly. Yeah, and the, the question I would, I mean, if yeah. I can get him on my show, oh, yeah, the question please. I would uh, ask him is, I mean, in in, 20, in the 2020s, the state perhaps that's still the most powerful in terms of mining oil or finding yes. oil is, is Saudi Arabia, which is a, a hardline religious state. So how would he explain exactly. that? Uh, <laughs> That's part of the thing. That's part of what I found um, confusing in this book. Uh, he would say that Saudi Arabia as a hardline religious state has taken its imperialist, um, what, what, what's the word I'm looking for? It's imperialist um, mission from the West, you know? So there's a lot, this is a very left-leaning book. It really places a lot, I think too much blame on Western um, culture as hegemonic. And believe me, I am all about Western culture being hegemonic. So re re reading between the lines here, Beth Ann, it doesn't sound as if you, I mean, how seriously should we take a book like this? I mean, it, I I think we should take it very seriously. Why? And I'll tell you why. Because this is a book of deep thought. I don't agree with everything that this author has to say, but he has really done his research. This is a book that actually can make you sit and argue with it, not throw it against the wall kind of arguing, but, you know, almost talking to it, almost thinking like you've got a person right there in front of you. This is a book that actually 
might be something I believe could help East and West learn a bit more about each other. You know, I, one of my favorite book titles is T. Caragas and Boyle's East is East. And, uh, it, you know, for so long, we've believed that never the twain shall meet. But I think that in states of the earth, we could look at why we are so far apart on things and actually realize that secularization is coming. Um, there maybe there's another religious movement on the horizon. I mean, let's face it, all of them, you know, are based on various things. I took two semesters of early Islamic history as an undergraduate, and it is a very interesting thing to me because it is so recent, relatively recent compared to um, Judaism and Christianity, and yet it has so much power in the world. I think we need to take. Dr. Meziane seriously. And I think we need to argue back. Well, it'll be interesting to read uh, The States of the Earth, an ecological and racial history of secularization um, alongside the great secularist yes. Salman Rushdie. His book, Knife, Meditations After an Attempted Murder, uh, is a book about perhaps in some ways, at least I'm guessing, religious extremism and religious violence. Finally, uh, the last uh, nonfiction book that you're suggesting in April is a really interesting one by one of the great masters, the American masters of nonfiction, Eric Larson, The Demon of Unrest. What is it about Eric Larson that makes him such a popular and successful writer, Beth Ann? Uh, you know, it's because Eric Larson always makes sure that there is some kind of hero in his books. And so it, it's, you know, kind of like, this kind of history, this kind of popular history writing, which Larson is superb at, at writing, okay? This is not just some, you know, sloppy, um, you, you know, toss-off. He, like uh, Meziane, does his research, but you need to have someone to root for. And in this book, you've got a really unusual character because this Major Robert Anderson was actually, a, he was an army officer, uh, and uh, actually, let me, am I getting that correct? Was he a Marine officer? Um, he was a commander of the forts in Charleston Harbor. And yeah, well, he, he was, was uh, he was in the uh, in the Civil War itself. So this yes. is a Civil War. This is this nonfiction Civil War. Nonfiction Civil War. So he was a slave owner. He was a Southerner. He lived in South Carolina. But this is before the Civil War began. And so as a military officer, he was under the command of his commander in chief, um, the very new President Abraham Lincoln. And so when Abraham Lincoln said, oh, all right, we are going to um, defend Fort Sumter against these upstarts who are attacking it, Major Anderson had to say, even though I am a Southerner who owns slaves and might have a lot of friends who are among these upstarts, I am going to defend Fort Sumter. So you have someone who is not only young and, you know, military, probably a bit dashing, but he's also torn. He's really conflicted between his personal life and his professional life. And so the demon of unrest, Anderson stands as that demon in a way. But what the demon really is, of course, for Larson, is what happens in a country before it has civil unrest? Because these are the six months leading up to the Civil War as we know it. And Do you think, um, uh, Beth Ann, that one of the one of the other reasons why Larson is so successful as a nonfiction writer is he brings the the skills of a of a novelist to her oh. subject. Absolutely. And I think that's something, you know, it's funny, we were talking about sociopath earlier, reading like fiction, you know, Larson definitely writes nonfiction that reads like fiction. And it his in his case, it's because he knows narrative so well. He knows the pacing of a good story so well. And so when it's time to take a beat, to take a pause, he brings in 
something else. For example, in this book, um, there's a woman named Mary Chestnut who was a Southern lady who kept diaries and she was an excellent writer. Uh, Mary Chestnut's Civil War has been used many, many times um, in the years since that war uh, as a perspective on women's lives and women's experiences. But Larson brings her in as an example of what's actually happening in Charleston on the ground while all of this foment is occurring. And I think that that is something he, he understood. We need pauses here. We don't need to just rush, you know, pell-mell into uh, the attack on Fort Sumter. We need to show the buildup. And I just think it's it's one of his best. Well, I'm guessing that of all these seven books, this this will be the one, perhaps, or maybe uh, Salman Rushdie's knife that will sell the best. But I believe so. As always, Beth Ann, I'm gonna get you to choose between your children. Uh, select one of of these seven books that you're mm -hmm. selecting for April. Most of us don't have the time or the the reading skills to. To, to read seven books in a month. Is there one book in particular that you would strongly suggest for the month? Uh, you know, I would probably go with Leif Anger's I Cheerfully Refuse. I think that is the book that uh, it, it appeals most to me and to my heart, but it's so beautiful and it will really speak to many of the anxieties that um, my fellow uh, readers have.